As many of you are aware, the last uh, few weeks we've been talking about the kingdom of God and Marty Shub came and began a series on the kingdom of God, the coming of Yeshua to establish his, <clears throat> his kingdom. And he described what is involved in some of, of some of that. And then Edie last week talked about discipleship in the kingdom, what it means to be a dis discipleship in this kingdom. <clears throat> and this week I'm going to talk about uh, the leadership of Yeshua, his kingdom leadership, what his call to leadership was and how he leads us. And it starts with love, of course. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in him. 1 John 3, 16. So the basis of his leadership is love. Since Jesus is the fullness of God, Colossians 2, 9, and since his Father leads by love, Jesus leads us by love. That's the cornerstone of how he leads us. He leads us with his love. And when we mention the word love, automatically connected to it is the word relationships, right? As soon as you mention the word love, first word that comes is relationships. Love is always in the context of relationships. Therefore, what are Yeshua's relationships that show us how he leads us? First, of course, there is the relationship with his Father in heaven. There are more than 50 verses that Yeshua says about his relationship with his Father in heaven, and some of them are in regard to leadership items. Okay. I summarize these just to give you an idea about his approach to leadership, identifying with his relationship with his Father this way. Luke 22, 29, those who he leads who are faithful, on them he confers a kingdom. So if we're faithful, on us he confirms a kingdom. John 5, 19 to 24, he only does what he sees his father doing. Okay? So when he's with us, leading us, that's a principle. John 5, 30, by the way he leads, he seeks only to please his father. He's not here to please us, first of all. Of course, he, he does that but this is a principle of leadership, okay? He leads to please his Father. John 8, 28, Jesus speaks only what his Father has taught him, okay? That's a principle of how he leads. John 10, 17, 18, he leads by lay laying down his life, a command he received from his Father. So he leads by sacrifice. John 12, 27 to 29. He leads even in death to glorify his Father's name. So he's, that's always on his heart when he's in and in among us. Okay. In leading these people, I'm going to glorify my Father in heaven. John 12, 50. When he leads, he says only what his Father told him to say and how his Father told him to say it. John 14, 28, and 31. He said his father was, the, was greater than he. He said his father was greater than he. And so that affects how he leads. He keeps his eyes on his father because he needs to know, he needs to communicate with his father and how he leads us. And finally, he does exactly what his father commands him to do. So you can see this relationship between father and son is total submission by son to father for a number of reasons. And that submission is going to come out in how he teaches here on earth. The next relationship, the Holy Spirit. Some verses that we need to pay attention to in regard to this relationship of Jesus and how he leads us, but how he brings the Holy Spirit into that whole dynamic. Jesus assured his disciples that the Holy Spirit would teach them at difficult times what they are to say to authorities. That is Luke 12, 11 to 12. So he's, he calms them. He says, hey, 
you're going to go through persecution, but hey, I'll be there, okay? I'm going to lead you. I'll show you what to say, okay? John 14, 15 to 18, when Jesus left them, the Father would send the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth, so that they were not left as orphans, okay? So he's, he's concerned about each of his children. He leads each of his children in a way that they never feel like orphans. John 14, 25, 26, the Holy Spirit will be sent to them to teach them all things and to remind them of what Yeshua said to them. Every good leader wants to have an effect where the people he's leading at some point are reminded. You know, oh yeah, I reminded that Joe said that, right? That's part of leadership, is teaching in such a way and leading in such a way that the people will remember two years later something that helps them. And so Jesus was very concerned about that, and that's why he, sent, he had the Holy Spirit come. And the third thing, which I think is really unique and interesting to me, is his relationship, his identity as son of God and son of man. Right? It's a very interesting relationship. There he is walking around as son of God and son of man. And it's difficult to, uh, for us to wrap our understanding around that whole issue. How to understand that? One of the ways it's really helped me is watching the series Chosen. Okay? And I try to look at it from that perspective, a number of different perspectives, but okay. In this episode, do I see the Son of God or do I see the Son of Man? And, and I think of the episode about the wedding in Cana when the water was turned to the wine. And there's a scene in that episode where he's alone. The room is a little dark. The pitchers of water are there. He asks everybody to leave. And he stands there and he puts his hands on the, the pitchers of water. He looks up and you can tell this is a moment of father and son together. Miracle worker, son of God, and the water turns to wine. And everybody's happy, everybody's joyful. And in the midst of that joy, there's another scene where there's some question as to whether Andrew is a good dancer or not. Remember that? And there's some joking among the disciples. And then they want to get Andrew up and dancing. So music starts and Andrew starts to dance and they all join around him. And Jesus is right there and you see this beautiful picture of Jesus and his disciples, hands on their shoulders, dancing around in the Jewish tradition. And that's a picture of him as son of man. He's just one of the boys, so to speak. It's beautiful. So it's those kind of images that have helped me understand more and more the Son of Man and Son of God dichotomy. I can summarize this by saying that uh, these relationships confirm he leads us in total submission and obedience to his Father and Father's will. And by assuring us, continually assuring us that the Holy Spirit isn't going to Leave, and we're not going to be orphans, okay? And that he totally understands our humanity because he is the Son of Man. He's there with us. This is a very personal relationship now. It's not God in heaven. It's Emmanuel. And there's a, a real personal touch to this, and I think that comes through in the series The Chosen. The next question is, okay, if... This leader of ours, what are his purposes? You know, leaders have purposes, okay? Whether they're leading a company or a bank or whatever, they have purposes. What were his purposes? And in the Bible, the book of Ephesians is known as the book that describes God's purposes. If you want to know the purposes of God, start by reading the book of Ephesians. So the first thing is... <coughs> This was really on his heart right from the get-go when he came here. 
He reconciled individuals to his father by his death on the cross. That, I think, is first and foremost. He sees what's going on on earth. He knows what's in his father's heart, and he wants to reconcile all of us to father. That reconciliation between God and individual. Then after that, he has to reconcile who? Jews and Gentiles, right? And Ephesians 2 talks about the breaking down of the barrier between Jews and Gentiles. Okay? So we see through the scripture, gradually the Gentiles are coming in more and more, and they're being welcomed and they're being questioned. But it gets to a point where Jesus' purpose is to reconcile Jews and Gentiles. And then once he reconciles them, he wants to unite them in a body, right? The body of Messiah, the bride of Christ. He came to, to have a body, right? In the Old Testament, it says that Israel was the father's bride. Okay? Father specifically identifies Israel as his bride. In the New Testament, okay, the bride is everybody in the world, potentially. All the Jews, all the Gentiles have the potential to be part of this bride of Christ, the spotless bride. So Jesus came to do that. His father wanted that for him. He wanted a different bride. And so once he unites the Jews and the Gentiles, gets, kind of gets them on the same page, then they can launch out as the bride of Christ and become the, the, the clean bride that he so wants, the spotless bride. And all, in doing all this, he fulfilled what was in the Old Testament as bar bread from Matthew 5, 17. He did not come to abolish the law and the prophets, but to fulfill them. So, so his purpose was to fulfill what was written in the Old Testament, to complete it, make it clearer, make it fuller, to fulfill the promises and the prophecies, to give us the new covenant, the covenant of grace and truth, to assure us that the Holy Spirit would come and be with us, and all of this was for the glory of God. So we have a leader that comes, and these are his purposes. He's walking them out. He's walking them out like no other. The key was character, as always, right? We know that. When we talk about leaders, we can talk about their gifting, we can talk about their anointing, but when, when it comes right down to it, Leadership relates to character, and Jesus is revealing his character throughout his walk with us. He is a servant king. He is not a king servant. There's a big difference between a servant king and a king servant. The kings of the world are kings and then they decide how they're going to serve, right? I'm king. Now, how am I going to serve? Yeshua is not that. Yeshua is servant. All the way through, he is servant. And he happens to be the king of Israel and our king. But he is a servant king, not a king servant. Please be reminded of that. It's absolutely clear. And because he is a servant king, his character comes out in that sense of being a servant. His obedience to his father that I've already talked about. His forgiveness, his salvation, freedom that comes from his truth his humility, his servant's heart, his sacrificial acts, 
his mercy that triumphs over judgment, his kindness, his patience, his long-suffering, his eternal grace and loyalty, his joy. This is his character. This is what he leads us with. This is what he leads us into and exhorts us to. If we walk with him, we want to be like him, right? More and more like him. More of you and less of me. Isn't that what we all say to the Lord? More of you and less of me. And a big part of that is more of your character, less of mine. Right? And there's numerous examples all the way through Scripture of these character traits of our leader that he wants us to follow and he wants us to participate in. Forgiveness. The story of the paralytic. That the friends lower him down into the, the home through the roof. Jesus says immediately, first words out of his mouth to this paralytic, your sins are forgiven. Beautiful. Salvation. The story of Zacchaeus, the tax collector. Didn't understand this. How can you be born again? Right? It's a beautiful picture of um, Jesus moving in his salvation gift. Freedom. The story of the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman at the well. You see this in the Chosen series. It's very well done. He's alone with her. He reveals himself to her. So she's totally excited. She runs back to the village. Wants to tell everybody in the village. <clears throat> the result is the villagers come. Salvation is in the air, right? He spends two days with them. Yes. Freedom. Two days, there was... Freedom spread all over that village. And then his humility. Extraordinary. Story in John 13. The Last Supper. What does he do? This king who's on his way to heaven. King of kings and Lord of lords. Just listen to what he does. John 13, beginning at verse 2. That evening meal was being served, and the devil was already prompted Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. He knows that. He could have done anything that night. He could have just been shown his power in innumerable ways. What does he do? Next verse. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around them. Now that's a function usually done by the servant of the house. Can you imagine this is happening? And this is what he chooses to do? Such humility? Such a lesson of leadership? He came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I'm doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part of me. Whoa, what a lesson in humility. What a lesson as to how he uses his power and his might. What a lesson for Peter. Eh? How many other teachers would have done that in the circumstance? How many other leaders, right? It's beautiful, humility. And then again, Peter again. <laughs> Peter comes up a number of times. 
in the context of Yeshua's character. You remember Peter denies Jesus three times, right? No, I don't know him. That's in John 18. In John 21, Jesus restores him, right? Brings him back. The sheep that's gone astray is back in. And how does he love it? How does he do it? He just says, Peter, do you love me? Right? Gets back to that word love in this context of his leadership. And of course, Peter just melts and Yeshua totally restores him. Mercy triumphing over judgment. What an example. Right? And of course, there's many instances in Scripture of Jesus' kindness. The woman with the alabaster jar of perfume comes to mind. Remember, she's there and the disciples are giving Jesus a hard time and everybody there is giving a hard time about the sinful woman being there with her alabaster jar. You know the story. He celebrates her. He forgives her sins, celebrates her and says, hey, you're going to be mentioned in the book and people will read about you forever. Yeah. And then this, I, I love this, this part um, about Jesus' patience. John 16, 29 to 31. I just have to read this to you. It's, it's, this is uh, just before he's arrested. <laughs> so he's with his disciples. Then Jesus' disciples said, Now you are speaking clearly and without figures of speech. Now we can see that you know all things and that you do not even need to have anyone ask you questions. This makes us believe that you came from God. Okay? This is three years, okay? <laughs> With these guys. <laughs> and right before he's arrested. And what's Jesus' response? You believe at last. Hallelujah. Right? His patience and perseverance for three years with these guys, they're walking at him. They see the mere 23 miracles. They see the three raisings of the dead. And, and it gets to the end. And this is what they say. And Jesus must be thinking, what have I been doing? What has been going on? I thought they were getting this. Goodness gracious. What did I have to do? You know? <laughs> and then, you believe at last. Hallelujah. <laughs> Talk about patience and long suffering, right? Eh? My goodness, there's hope for all of us. <laughs> and then his grace comes out in an extraordinary way in, in Paul's life, a leader who just pours out grace. This is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 9 to 10. For I am the least of all apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church. But by grace of God I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. Right? Isn't that beautiful? grace of our leader and how we respond to that, right? And then his loyalty, of course, his loyalty is fully shown when after he resurrects, he spends 40 days with his disciples continuing to teach them about the kingdom, to continue to encourage and exhort them. He breathes on them during the time of his teaching. Yes, it's just... Um, it's just confirmation of those words from Deuteronomy 31.6. Never will I leave you or forsake you. That's leadership. The leader enters into leadership with that frame of mind. And of course, this joy 
we've talked about this recently. Somebody mentioned it. It's the story of the 99 sheep and the one sheep goes astray and the shepherd leaves to go get the one sheep. And the conclusion of the story is there is great joy in heaven over this. See, that's how our leader sees the joy. What gives him joy? What he celebrates is the return of one person to the kingdom. And of course, I could say much more. In fact, books have been written about this, of course, but I just want to leave you and close with a few thoughts that help focus us, help us to be able to respond to our leader and realize just his, how his beautiful character has given us this as kind of a foundational way to process in our daily lives as we go forward. And the first one, his thoughts are not, th are not our thoughts and his ways are not our ways. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. <clears throat> the Lord gave me that scripture early on in my walk and I'm so grateful he did because I was having a hard time figuring things out. I really was. <laughs> and then I came across this scripture and I said, oh, okay, I can relax, okay? I'm not going to be able to figure everything out, okay? Things are going to happen and I'm just going to have to give it back to the Lord. Why? Because his thoughts are not my thoughts, neither are his ways my ways. So that instantly gave me a measure of peace, which, you know, a good leader does. Then, this encouraged me as well, he does nothing without revealing his plan to his servants, the prophets, Amos 3, 7. In times like we live in, in times like this, that's a very reassuring word that there's going to come a time when his plans are going to be known through his prophets. That'll give us peace. That'll give us understanding. And we can move forward if we're faithful in that plan. Thirdly, he is always willing for us to come to him so he can reason together with us. Isaiah 118. Isn't that comforting? When I read that, it was really comforting to me to know that this king of the universe is always willing to come right close to me and reason with me, talk about things, you know, or in a group in a leadership team in a, of a church or whatever, when you're alone or when you're with others, you can just say, Lord, help. Come and reason together with me on this. Such humility that he would come down and, and be so concerned that he would have his eye on you to the point where he can sit and reason with you and say, no, no, Mike, you better not do it that way. There's a better way, right? Let's talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. It's so comforting to know that, that that's part of his leadership. <clears throat> Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. Pro Proverbs 3.5. Isn't that encouraging? That there is a way that this path that is going all over the place is pretty helter-skelter, that he can make it straight for you. He will come and help and make it straight. And once again, it's acknowledging, I don't understand it, I can do it, but I'm leaning on his understanding. I'm leaning on reasoning with him. I'm leaning, leaning on his thoughts and his ways that are higher than my ways. And the end result, it's going to be a straight path. That's his promise. So, God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in him. 
Yeshua leads us in love. His character, his kingdom character, comes from the kingdom love. And so, let's pray. So, Lord, we're just um, truly awed and grateful that you are our leader, Yeshua. that your beautiful character has been revealed to us because of that love. You have revealed clearly that you are a servant king, not a king's servant. That call is on us as well, Lord. You clearly have that call on our lives. If we follow you, service we are servants of others, servants of you. We are not priests, servants. We are servants and then priests. We thank you, Lord, for your example, for your leadership. We thank you that you will never leave or forsake us as you lead and guide us and teach us how to be leaders as well. Yes, Lord. And Lord, we pray for that same humility that led you so well. So well. Continues to lead you so well in our midst, Lord. We pray for your anointings your character anointings, Lord. Your character anointings. And we ask this in Yeshua's name. Amen.